Today I've got a fantastic application of Jensen's inequality for you. Suppose I have these n positive numbers a1 to an, and I've got another collection of positive numbers b1 to bn. Then, then we have this fantastic and amazing looking inequality. Let's call this expression one. Now I wrote it in this kind of com compressed way uh, so that I could fit it into the thumbnail. So let's unroll this a bit and see what this all means. The first term is the nth root of the product of all the a k's. Second term is likewise nth root of the product of all the b's and that's less than or equal to this. So it's the product of all these pairwise sums of the a's and b's and I take the nth root of that. So what does this all mean? Well this is the geometric mean of the of the a k and this is the geometric mean of the b k and this is the geometric mean of these pairwise uh, sums of the a and b and so what what this is saying is that the geometric mean of the a's and the ge plus the geometric mean of the b's has to be less than or equal to the geometric mean of these uh, a plus b's that's very interesting this is um uh, a bit more advanced than all of the uh previous uh, classic inequalities that we've seen before. And here's an exercise for you. Why don't you try this with a computer program? Uh, get some random numbers together and calculate this and see if this is true and do a bunch of trials for this. And you get extra points if you do it in some weird and unusual language. And if you do, tell me about it in the comments. Now let's review Jensen's inequality. Here we have a convex function, and I've taken a particularly nice example of a function that's convex everywhere. f of x is cosh x. So if f is a convex function, then I get Jensen's inequality. And if you don't know this, I have a playlist. Yeah, I have a playlist on Jensen's inequality and convex functions. And I will be adding more and more stuff to that in the future because it's a super interesting topic. So I start with these quantities q1 to qn and they're all non-negative. So that's greater than or equal to zero. And they're constrained with an interesting property. The sum of all the q's is one. So the q's actually behave like probabilities. And that's kind of interesting. So now let, uh, let us choose a collection of x's that are in the domain where f is convex. So we'll choose them to be in some interval. So for example, from here to here, okay, here's some x's, is chosen in an interval where uh, the function f of x is convex. So if I have those conditions, I have uh, as a consequence this amazing inequality, f of this sum like this is less than or equal to the following like so and this my friends this is Jensen's inequality this is a very very powerful and general idea so all I have to do is select some convex function and I get some amazing inequality and by a, you know careful choosing of these f's I can then generate all kinds of classic inequalities. Now I've done all of that in this playlist so you should watch that. It's very interesting. One thing I'd like to point out is that uh, f doesn't really have to be convex everywhere. It just has to be convex over the interval where you're you're choosing these x's. Let's have a closer look at the unpacked form of that original statement of the problem. So in examining this, we see that we have actually two different collections of positive numbers. We have A's and B's. But in the Jensen inequality, we had only one collection. We had the X's. The Q's are uh, constraint coefficients. We have only one kind of variable in Jensen's. But here we have two variables, A and B. But we have to do something about this and get rid of... Um, one of them. We have to transform this thing into something closer to Jensen's inequality. And we can get a bit closer 
uh, by eliminating one collection of these arbitrary positive numbers. So let's divide everything by the Bs, by the product of the Bs. We'll divide everything by actually the root of the product of the Bs, by this thing here. This term is strictly positive, so I don't have any trouble dividing by it. So I end up with one of these repetitive stress injury type uh, equation or inequalities or expressions that we often get in mathematics where it kind of hurts to keep writing this but okay it's going to get simpler this cancels out so i can simplify things now great so i end up with this on the left and this i can divide each one of these by the corresponding b here and I get this, and this is pretty good because now everything is in terms of one variable, ak over bk. This is you can consider to be like one quantity, one, one collection of uh, quantities, not two separate ones. So I think that this is the uh, one of the key observations. There's another key one coming up uh, later, but this is a key observation. And with this idea, things start to fall into place. Now, I can also write this, I mean, really simply, I'll write it as A less than or equal to B. Okay, left and right hand sides. And A, both A and B are strictly positive. Okay, none of these, none of these quantities here are zero. So in a situation where a is less than or equal to b and both are positive, I can also say that log a is less than or equal to log b. And why is that? Why? Because log is a monotone function. It's monotone increasing. So I can do this. I can say this. OK, so that helps. So the next step, let's apply log to both sides of this thing. I get this on the left, and what do I get on the right now? Yeah, I get this, but I can simplify this because I can take that uh, n out. Then the log will change this product into a sum of logs. So I just repeat this left-hand side, and now let me work on the right-hand side. There, that's pretty nice. That looks pretty good. I get this nice sum. And this should already start to ring a bell, and it's already starting to look more like Jensen's inequality because there's a sum on the right-hand side in Jensen's inequality. All right, now we do a clever substitution. AK over BK is e to the power of XK. Now, why am I doing this? Well, it's going to simplify many things here. This whole uh, big monster root here is going to become a lot simpler. And with a bit of hindsight, it's going to make things look even more like Jensen's inequality. All right, so let me work on this and apply this substitution and see what happens. So this is actually this product to the power of 1 over n. And now I make my substitution, this very clever substitution here, and I get this. And let me continue. And I get that, so that's quite interesting. Now let me write the rest of this entire thing using the substitution. And I get this, so let me highlight this whole thing. Okay, great, and I can call this inequality two. This is the transformed version of inequality one. This 2 here is equivalent to the original inequality. So if we can prove 2, we have proved 1. Now, if you have a keen eye, you can probably guess the function involved here that would make this into a case of Jensen's inequality. You see here on this side, there's a log e to the power x plus 1. And here, too, you have a log e to the power of something plus one, and that is actually the exact same form as Jensen's inequality. So what you can do is sit back and look at this and use your vision, your mathematical imagination, your mathematical vision, and see in your mind's eye that this is actually the same thing. It's a special case of 
Jensen's inequality, try to see that. But of course, we have to prove that, and that's what's coming up next. This was my transformed inequality 2. Now I distributed the 1 over n to all the terms on the right. This already looks a lot like Jensen's, but we have to make that more explicit and more clear. Let's take these Jensen q's to be like this. q1 is 1 over n, q2 is 1 over n, and so on. qn is 1 over n, so they'll all be 1 over n. So what is the sum of these things? Well, the sum of all of them is just n over n, and that is 1. So that is looking really good. And they're all positive, so I can put a little note here. 1 over n, n is a positive number. Now, from this, we get a clue that our function just might be something like this. f of x is log e to the x plus 1. So let's plug this into Jensen's inequality. I hope you didn't forget Jensen's inequality with the f's, the x, and the q's, and all that. OK, so if you did forget it, just go back to the beginning of the video. Or maybe you don't have to go all the way to the top of the video. I just wrote it out for you now, just to save you that bit of trouble. Great, so let's plug in our f here and here and here and here. OK, so it's uh, more of this repetitive stress injury type of uh, writing, but I'll just power through that. On the left, we get this. And on the right, we get this. Now, this is exactly the same thing as 2. So I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, ha ha, we're done. Yay, yay. No, we're not done. We're not done because we don't know if f is convex. Remember, f needs to be convex for Jensen's inequality to work. And we need to prove this. OK, so I need some room. Well, convex over what interval? Let's see. We did this substitution. Now, it's possible for a k over b k to be less than 1. Why not? I mean, as long as it's greater than 0, we're OK. I mean, it's possible for a to be really big and b to be really small, but both positive, yeah? So if this is true, then x, our variable x, can actually be negative. So in fact, x can be anywhere on the real line. So x is got to be any element of r. So we have to make sure that f of x is convex everywhere, not just on uh, a small interval, but it has to be. For this to be true for any a's and b's, well, any positive a's and b's, then it's got to be convex everywhere. So here I made a plot of f of x, and I did it for x from minus 3 to 3. And yeah, it does look convex, f of x. Yeah. But how do we know it's convex? And here's the key, another key. I said there's a couple of key observations. Well, f is convex if the second derivative of f is positive. So this is the other key thing that you have to notice. And with this, now we can solve our problem f of x is log e to the power x plus 1. f prime of x is like this. All right, so what we can do is uh, use the uh, division rule for derivatives. u is the numerator, v is the denominator, and it's easy to find derivatives. u prime is e to the x, and v prime is e to the x. And we use the division rule, and now put everything in. What happens here is that this e to the x times e to the x disappears, and we get, let us not forget the square, we get this. Now, e to the x is always positive everywhere, and of course, e to the x plus 1, this is always st strictly, e to the x plus 1 squared is always strictly positive everywhere. And so, we can get the final answer now. Second derivative is positive everywhere, so... So f of x is convex everywhere. And so, therefore, therefore, inequality 2 is true. And therefore, inequality 1 is true. An amazing sequence of events, of reasoning, totally 
awesome. I think this is the best uh, Jensen inequality illustration I've found so far, and I'm sure I'm going to find some other really good ones, and I will put them into the playlist. This was, I believe, a Putnam uh, competition problem. So if you can follow this whole thing and you can do it with your eyes closed now, well, you, you've done a Putnam problem. Okay, like, comment, and subscribe. Send me a super thanks so that I can get some physiotherapy for all of this repetitive stress writing of inequalities and lengthy expressions. <laughs> and I will see you next time with more amazing mathematics.